But there's one book in the Bible whose primary purpose is to inform us about this cultus or this set of rituals, and that is the book of Leviticus. But to understand Leviticus, we need to understand its arrangement because it actually helps us to focus on the materials in uh, parallel lines. First seven chapters of the book deal with rituals, but these are rituals about sacrifices, very specific, five sacrifices and the individual rituals for each one of them. At the other end of the book, they are also rituals, but this time it's the festivals. But to understand the rituals of Israel, you need to understand both the sacrifices and the festivals. In the next set of parallels, we have some priestly material. First, we have priestly history in chapters 8 to 10, and then some priestly legislation, 21 to 22. The redundancy of the priesthood once Jesus had appeared means that apart from some academic interests, these priestly legislation have very little to do with our lives. But the priests had to live by a much, much higher code of conduct. For instance, if a priest was sick, he could not minister in the sanctuary. If a priest had a handicap, he could not minister in the sanctuary. If he failed any of the ritual rules, he could end up dead in the sanctuary. So the legislations were very uh, specific. Even whether he can marry, who he can marry, and who he should not marry, all of that was taken into account to safeguard the lives of the priests. The next set of parallels have to do with clean and unclean. Some of the clean and unclean has to do with food, some of it has to do with hygiene, some has to do with infectious diseases, uh, some had to do with house cleaning. And this is a bit surprising because God is concerned about everything from how we look after our homes, how we look after our bodies, how we look after the sick, and so on and so forth. This structure is called a chiastric or concentric structure. And the centerpiece is the one that matters. The centerpiece of Leviticus with no parallel lines is Yom Kippur, the so-called Day of Atonement. Now there is some epilogue material, promises and commitment, which have nothing to do with the rituals per se. You can read those in your own. Uh, certain expectations that God have when we make promises to him. But Yom Kippur becomes focal point. There are two focal points in uh, the life of Israel, the rituals, specifically the sacrifices, and Yom Kippur. All the other materials are important, but these two help us to understand the religion of the sanctuary. The first focal point is what we call the Tamid. It's a rather difficult word to translate because it can mean daily, it can mean regular and uh, various other meanings, but it seems to talk about things that happen every single day of the week. There are three things that happen every day of the week. The sacrifices at the altar, the menorah or the candlestick, the light, and the incense. We already learned that the table of bread that was only once a week and uh, the Ark of the Covenant is only once a year, and we will look at that separately. That's the second focal point. And the basin is as, as needed. Yeah, it probably was used every day. But this sacrifice, the burnt offering had to be offered every morning and every evening. The lambs had to be oiled and refreshed every morning and every evening. The incense had to be offered every morning and every evening. These three activities were tamid. These happen every single day of the year, even on the so-called festival days, even on Shabbat. These three things never stopped. The life of Israel, the calendar of Israel, if you like, was marked by these three activities. These were the focal points of Israel's daily routine. And so if you were an Israelite living in the 15th, 16th century when this was first instituted, you probably had to stop and collect your 
understanding of time by, by these. They became the clock of Israel every morning, every evening, at dawn and at dusk, like clockwork, cannot fail. Now, exactly how they kept time? Well, this is the Middle East. It's slightly below the tropics, and so time is fairly even. And so to some extent, we must be cautious in applying these to our lives. But sacrifice, the need for light and incense, which stands for only one thing in the Bible, and that is prayer. These are necessities of the cultus. And this was the main work of priests. By the time Solomon's temple was built, there were so many priests that David reorganized the priesthood into 24 groups, 24 orders they were called. And each group or two groups would work for one month and then the next two groups would come over and they would recycle through the year. It ended up that if you were a priest, you only worked for one month. The high priest worked for one day, normal priests worked for one month, but for the Israelites, worship happened every single day. There was always some priests on duty, day and night, Shabbat or no Shabbat, regular day or festival day, there were always priests on duty. To tell Israel that you are never disconnected from God, it's almost as if to say the presence of God never takes a holiday. Now the Jewish calendar or the Israel's calendar was 360 days a year. So for 360 days, God was always with them. And so when the temple of Solomon was destroyed and they found themselves in exile, that was the first question in their mind. Is God still with us? Now, Israel never had any congregational worship, even on Shabbat. They never actually had a time where they come together like we do in one place and worship. They simply gathered around the sanctuary. We have some evidence in the Bible and rabbinic writings that every morning and every evening as the priests were getting ready to offer that first burnt offering of the day, or the last one for the day, that the congregation of Israel would gather or stand outside their tents or gather around uh, the tabernacle as this was going on. The point of that morning and evening exercise is simply to remind them, you start the day with God and you bring it to a close with God, telling yourself that God is with you. So when we look at the sacrifices, we need to understand the elements that are attached to these sacrifices. The first element, which is missed by many churchgoers, is this. God says you cannot come into the sanctuary with empty hands. You have to bring some kind of offering. It could be a lamb. It could be a goat. It could be just a handful of flour, depending on your need and your status. But you must always bring something. The sacrifice was seen as the connection between God and humans. And so you cannot come into his presence without that connection. The term that is often used and then repeated in the New Testament about sacrifices or these offerings is the term korban. And korban means an offering that is given to God that you cannot take back, even with regret. The first lesson that the New Testament church was taught was a lesson of Korban. Here was a couple, Adonias and Sapphira, who had made a promise to give, when they sold their property and whatever they had, to give all of that money to the church. But when they actually saw the money in their hands, they were like, surely God is not going to miss anything. And so they came, brought the money, kept some of it. And Peter asked them, why did you lie to God? We didn't lie. We didn't do anything wrong. They both ended up, ended up dead. It was a very harsh lesson. If you have made a promise, an offering to God, you cannot have regrets about it. You cannot take it back. Because money is a very strange thing. We make a promise to God, and then when we actually see the money sign in our eyes, something else happened. So Korban was a very rigid rule of sacrifice. A third principle of sacrifice is tamim, 
when you bring something to God, it must be faultless. So if the sacrifice is an animal, it must be without disease, without torn skin, without broken bones. It must also be of the right age. A two-year-old lamb is the most common requirement. Anything else would be considered unacceptable. A non-tamim sacrifice would not be accepted. One of the reasons why the priests guarded that entrance is to inspect the sacrifices. And this practice carried all the way to the time of Jesus, but they found a loophole in that. We are told that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that he is like us in every respect in the New Testament, we are told this, but sinless. He is tamim. Because a sacrifice that is not tamim cannot be a substitute for our sin. And that's why the only one who can be our redeemer is Christ, not some faulty human, not even created angels. Tamim is not about amount. It's about the largeness of our hearts. Jesus and the disciples were standing by the temple. He wanted them to learn this lesson. Watch the people drop in huge amounts of coins into that treasury box. And then a widow with only two coins waited until the crowd was gone, and then she dropped them in. Jesus asked the disciples, which offering was tamim? Because that means it's accepted by God, the rest is not. And to the surprise of the disciples, he told them that the two coins of the woman, that was the tamim offering, because she gave the best she had, and probably all that she had. We discover this corollary to that. When God spelled out the sacrifices that they should bring, to the temple, to the tabernacle, there were no exorbitant demands. In fact, there was a clear rule that they should be in proportion to the social status and economic status of the worshiper. And so a very poor Israelite did not have to bring a lamb or anything like that. He could just bring some flower in his hand and God would accept that because it is the heart of the offering that makes them tamim not the exorbitance of it. In most of the sacrifices, the worshippers' participation was involved. Many of us don't realize, when you bring your lamb to the priest, it was not the priest who had to kill the lamb. It was the worshipper who had to kill the lamb. He had to slice his throat from down here, cut the carotid artery. The worshipper also had to skin the lamb, the animal, and then chop it into pieces. At that stage, all that the priest did was to collect the blood, which would be splashed at the altar. And then you have to take those pieces and wash them at the basin area. Only after that, the priest will take them and put them at the altar for burning. And so when you brought a sacrifice to the tabernacle, you didn't come there for 30 minutes, for 40 minutes. You probably were there for a couple of hours. Now, how many of us here know how to kill a lamb or a goat? How to skin it fully? How to chop it into pieces? How long would that take, most of us? So the Israelites became expert butchers in a manner of speaking because it was part of their worship. I think the lesson here is this, that human sin is expensive. It has a very high cost on life. And that is transferred to a substitute. However, with each of the five sacrifices in Leviticus, you meet the same expressions at the end. After describing the sacrifice, it would say there are three effects of the sacrifice. A pleasing aroma to God, that it made atonement, and it brought forgiveness. Now, all three things only God can do. Despite what we hear in the New Testament about forgiving our enemies, in the Old Testament, only God can forgive sins. This is why you have to bring a sacrifice. And only God can make atonement. That is how the relationship between God and humans, or even between humans, is repaired. But I like the first one. Has, have you ever walked down some lane on a big mall, and somebody passes by with a beautiful perfume, and you immediately go, wow, that was nice perfume, and look around, who is it? Sacrifices 
seem to have that effect of, on God. It's a very unusual expression that you don't encounter anywhere else. That the sacrifice, whatever it was, was a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It's as if God looks at this sacrifice and he takes a deep breath and he says, wow, this is good. And this is why it must be tamim and korban and, you know, and all of those stuff because of the effects on God. Now, on humans, we receive atonement, the repairing of broken relationships, and forgiveness. And that is the repairing of sin, which only God handles. This is a very interesting aspect of the book of Leviticus, that God finds pleasure in our offerings. Isaiah would say that we must remember to make the Sabbath a pleasure, a delight to, to, to God, because it is part of our sacrifice as well. Big question is, why sacrifice? Isn't there some easier way? Well, Exodus 20 actually gives us the perfect reason for sacrifice. The book begins with a relational statement. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then it gives us 10 lifestyle expectations. Therefore, you will not have other gods, make images or take his name in vain. You will keep his Sabbath. Uh, you will honor your parents. You will not take anything that does not belong to you, etc. But right after the Ten Commandments, which most people who read Exodus 20 don't see the importance of this, God gives instructions on altar. This is long before we meet the command to build a sanctuary. God asked Moses to build an altar and offer sacrifice. It took me a long while of research and uh, contemplation to figure out what was the reason for that altar. Exodus 20 has three parts, the relational statement, the lifestyle expectations, and this altar sacrifice nexus. And then it occurred to me uh, when I studied the sanctuary more fully, the primary reason for altar that sacrifice altar is the compensation for human failure. You see, God has made us his people. He has given us his expectations, but we will fail. And when we fail, there is the compensation. There is the contingency. So only reason why sacrifices were asked of Israel. They were a reminder of that contingency. No matter what you do, no matter how much you fail, God keeps a way for us to stay connected with him. As long as there was an altar, this is why sacrifice was burned there nonstop. As long as there was an altar, as long as that fire was available, we are connected to God. So what are these sacrifices? Well, I'm going to give you the Hebrew names and the usual English translation or the less usual English translation. The most common is Ola, an easy one to remember, Ola burnt offering. This is the one that the priest offered every morning and every evening, and the individual worshiper can also bring one. It was a multi-purpose offering, but primarily it served as the cover offering. And the lesson was as long as there was an Ola on that altar, then Israel was safe. They were covered by the grace of God. Then you have the next offering is Minka, which literally means the grain offering. This is the first offering ever mentioned in the Bible in Genesis. And this was not a sin offering. It was purely a worship offering. Think of it like a harvest offering. You know, it's a gratitude offering because you've had a good harvest. So you bring uh, the best to, to God. This one is shalem, which is derived from the word shalom and is translated peace offering or fellowship offering. Again, it's just a worship offering. Nothing to do with sin. Khatat is a sin offering. But it's real. It's usually translated as sin offering in English Bibles. But its real purpose is purification. So many modern OT scholars call this the purific purification uh, offering, purification sacrifice. Uh, the instruction is this. If you have committed a sin against God's instructions, against God's law, uh, and then you become aware that you've done the wrong thing, then you bring this offering to the temple. And so the primary target of katat is the commandments of God. 
the most serious of the offerings is Hashem. Its primary purpose is to repair broken relationships among humans. It used to be called the guilt offering. It was also called the trespass offering. But in today's language, it's the reparation offering. Jesus told his disciples, if you are on your way to the temple to give an offering to God, but you remember that you have something or a brother has something against you, leave your offering there, go back and make things right with that brother, and then you can bring your offering to the Lord. And in Ashem, the Israelites were told, they first had to repair the relationship, repair the damages, then bring the offering to the temple. Uh, the sins committed here are all relational sins. So if you commit fraud, if you steal from your brother, or if you cheat your brother, you have to repair that relationship. Let me just explain it in a simple way. Let's say you cheat somebody of a thousand ringgit. Well, you have to pay back the thousand ringgit. You have to add 20% interest to it. And then you have to bring an offering to the temple. And the only offering for Hashem is a ram, which was rather unaffordable for most people. And we can imagine this was a difficult offering for Israel. Now the Ola could be used as a combination offering with Katar, with Hashem, with Minka, and so on. So sometimes it's also used for sin, sometimes it's used purely for worship. The second focal point of Israel's calendar is Yom Kippur. This happens on the 10th day of the seventh month called Tishri. This was the most important day of the year. It's the end of one year and the beginning of another year in the religious calendar. In our modern calendar, this usually falls in late September and early October and so on. If you check up Google for Yom Kippur for 2023, you'll find the date there. We are coming very close to Yom Kippur uh, time. The only person who functioned during Yom Kippur is the high priest. No one else works in Yom Kippur. Not the priests, not the Levites, only the priests, only the high priest. This is the time when Pastor Ho has to do everything by himself. Nobody allowed to assist him. Uh, Pastor Ho, I don't know if you would like this job, even though you're called high priest sometimes. It's a difficult job. Uh, good thing, only once a year. He starts the day by offering a burnt and a sin offering for himself and his family. So that's the first thing. And then he does a burnt and a sin offering for the entire nation. And then he has to cleanse or renew the, the entire structure. And this must take place in a reverse order. And how does he do that? Well, there are two goats that were used during Yom Kippur. Okay, we'll talk about the two goats separately. One of them becomes the cleansing agent. Well, the blood of that goat becomes a cleansing agent. So the priest would go into the, the high priest, into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle the blood of that first goat seven times and walk backwards. And each step he has to sprinkle on every piece of furniture all the way out until he reaches the outside uh, entrance and then sprinkles the blood on the people. Okay, so the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, the altar, and also the camp. And in terms of the people, so the cleansing or the renewal begins with himself as the high priest, and then his family, and then ultimately the entire community as well. What really happened on Yom Kippur? For one day, Israel were taught that there was no sin in the camp, symbolically or literally. That was the day when sin was eradicated from the camp. But to understand that, we need to understand this second God. The first God is simply called Yahweh's God. The second God is more problematic. See, the priests had to handle the two gods for the cleansing purpose, the God that was called Yahweh's God, and for the removal purpose, the second goat, which was called Azazel's goat. Now, the 
there is so much discussion about Azazel. Is this the name of a demon? The word Azazel can mean complete destruction, can mean a rocky precipice, and the King James Bible and the early English translations call it the scapegoat. This was more the Latin influence. <clears throat> Not really a good translation. And some church scholars through history have even argued that Azazel represents Christ because, you know, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What is clear is that Azazel is a personal name. Okay, and it appears only in this context, doesn't appear anywhere else. So when you look at the parallelism, we are told that one goat is for Yahweh, the other goat is for Azazel. And the parallelism tells us that these are meant to contrast each other. The goat for Yahweh was used for cleansing. The goat for Azazel was used for removal of sin. The priest, when everything was done, would place the high priest, place his hands on the second goat, and then it would be driven out into the desert and destroyed. So Azazel most probably represents Satan. To understand Yom Kippur, we need to understand, first of all, that offerings were present. Two different kinds of offerings for the priest himself, the high priest himself, and for the nation. And that the high priest is the one who makes atonement. He's the one now who stands truly between God and, uh, and the humans okay, going through this process. He's the only one who's allowed into that holy of holies. Otherwise, no one else could make this atonement. And appearing in that Holy of Holies means that he can now renew and cleanse the entire sanctuary. And you will see why this had to be done. What is also important about Yom Kippur, this is based strictly on how the Hebrew language functions, is that the things in the tabernacle are the direct object of atonement. In fact, the people of Israel had one week to prepare for Yom Kippur. And if they were not prepared ritually for Yom Kippur, they were not even allowed to participate. They were cut off from the camp. They actually had to leave the camp. So the people who gathered around the sanctuary on Yom Kippur were not a sinful people. They were a people as completely clean as humans could be. So they were not the reason for the Yom Kippur rituals. It was the objects, things that were contaminated by the sins of Israel. But the Israelites were the beneficiaries of atonement. So this cleansing process, that's why they were the last one to receive the sprinkling of the blood, means that they would enjoy that one day from being completely sinless. This is the only day when blood entered into the Holy of Holies. And the strongest word for sin in Hebrew, for sin that can be atoned, pesha, is said to have entered the Holy of Holies. And so this is very significant, that on this day, something really, really unholy entered the presence of God. But what it tells us is this, that God is the one who takes total and complete responsibility for human sin. Redemption, salvation could not happen unless God is willing to do that. And so all those texts in Pauline writings about Christ, in the Hebrews about Christ, it's much easier to understand them, all the substitutionary aspects of everything these New Testament scholars wrote, they all arise from uh, the sanctuary, the sanctuary language. That's what we will look at in our third session. So what happens on the Day of Atonement? Complete removal of sin. At the end of that day, when the services were over, uh, for a high priest, those services lasted from dawn till dusk. This is the longest worship service in the life of Israel that happens every year, 12-hour worship service. Most Adventists I know would die from a 12-hour worship service. It's also the only day when the Israelites were not allowed to eat, the only truly fast day of the calendar. Okay, so... 12 hours, no food, no water, standing by that tabernacle as the high priest goes through the motions of the ritual, 
that was a pretty awesome day. Something you'd remember for the rest of your calendar year. So why does this have to happen? Understanding the symbolism of how sin works enables us to understand uh, what really happens. During the normal days of the year, the sins of Israel via their sacrifices, their contacts with the priests, their entrance into the courtyard, these sins moved from the camp of Israel into the tabernacle. Of course, the farthest they could go would be the last curtain here. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, we were taught that for every sin, the blood was taken and sprinkled on that curtain. Can you imagine from a scientific point of view what that curtain would be like for 359 days? But actually, in Leviticus and Numbers, we are told that only two kinds of sins were sprinkled at that curtain. And that is the sin of the high priest and the sin of the nation, a collective sin. The rest of the blood was splashed around this altar and immediately consumed by the heat of the altar. On Yom Kippur, God devised a system whereby this entire movement of the contagion of sin would be reversed. And starting from the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, the sin is removed and travels outward through that second goat of Azazel outside the camp. Eventually, they realized the symbolism was so powerful that they ended up pushing the animal off a cliff or actually killing it in the desert so that the goat will not come back into the camp of Israel. Can you imagine what that would have been like symbolically for that goat to reappear in the camp? And the sacrifices enable the Israelites to come into the sanctuary. Yom Kippur allows God to remove sin completely from the camp. And so at the end of Yom Kippur, every Israelite could stand in the presence of God completely sinless, completely whole, completely tamim. The New Testament picks up this sacrifice idea in interesting ways. It says that our sacrifices are praised, Hebrews chapter 13. It says that our bodies are sacrifices, Romans 12 that our bodies should be treated as a sanctuary, as a temple, 1 Corinthians 3. And so this is really significant to the New Testament. And then it says that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And that imagery is not just Ola, but also the imagery of Yom Kippur. He's the one who carries the sins of the world. And when that Lamb appears in the presence of God, Revelations 4 and 5, the whole of God's kingdom is contaminated by our sin, but by grace we are saved, and so God devises a system where one day all sin will be removed, literally. And all of us who know a little bit about Revelation know that this does not actually happen until the lake of fire. The death or the destruction of that God of Azazel means that sin itself is gone. The lake of fire means that sin is gone. Even the original uh, instigator of sin, Satan, will be gone. And that is why when this is over, Israel has a brand new fresh start. And Revelation backs this up. When that lake of fire has completed its work, we have a new heaven and a new earth. So this is very important to understanding how salvation works. God tolerates our sins. He does that through sacrifices, these substitutions. And then through the work of the high priest, sin will be eradicated. Not just sidelined, but completely eradicated. It will not reappear a second time. That's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. All of those lessons are embedded here in this simple structure that God gave them. Everybody can come into the courtyard and everybody can bring a sacrifice and that connects you to God. And then the priest can provide a second layer of connection through the intercession that happens in here and praying for you. And then the high priest will provide the ultimate renewal to a new creation 
by removing and eradicating sin completely from the camp, from God's people. You see, when Leviticus says, or when God in Leviticus says, be holy as I am holy, he envisions all of this happening to his people. That one day we will be truly sinless the way that he is sinless. And so he became like us in every respect, says Hebrews, so that we can become like him as well. Now, we learn that Yom Kippur is basically about that final resolution of sin. And to see this, we need to see how complex sin is treated in Leviticus 16. In that one short chapter of the book, there are 11 different words for sins in Hebrew. It's amazing how many words for sin there are in Hebrew. English is very poor by comparison. But at the heart of Yom Kippur, a discussion of sin, you find these. Katat, which is the lowest level sin, and Pesha, which is the highest level redeemable sin. There is one sin beyond Pesha that cannot be redeemed. And so these two words, Pesha and Katat, covers the entire spectrum of sins that God will redeem. And when we understand that, we see that on Yom Kippur, every sin, every sin is out of the picture as well. Now the word Kippur, Yom means day. The word Kippur comes from a Hebrew verb, afar. This verb has normally been translated into English as atone. So the day of atonement. Uh, what God does is to atone for sin. But when you understand the actual literal meanings of kafar, I think it gives us a clearer picture of what atonement is. The verb kafar has two meanings, two very different meanings. One means to cover, the other is to remove. You see, throughout the year, sin is being covered by the sacrifices, by that ola every morning and every evening, by the work of the priest. God is covering our sins so that when Anybody looks at us, God says, look, he's covered. This is grace at work. But on Yom Kippur, far means not just to cover any longer, but to actually remove those sins. They are taken out of the picture. This is judgment at work. That's why Yom Kippur is often seen as a day of judgment in the Bible. But I think that is a little narrow understanding of what it really means. On this day, the judgment that God does is not to investigate people's sin, not to find out if we deserve heaven or not, but to actually remove sin. That's the purpose of this judgment. And so during the year, Kafar is covering our sin through the sacrifices. And on Yom Kippur day, our sins are actually removed. If you were an Israelite at that period, no matter how bad the year has gone for you, no matter how many things you've done wrong, you probably look forward to Yom Kippur, the one day when you can breathe a sigh of relief and know I am all right in the presence of God, completely all right. This is an amazing, amazing lesson which lots and lots of Christians in our world today never seem to catch. Maybe the absence of visual makes it hard. We never seem to have that point in our relationship with God where we feel totally free that there is nothing between God and us, that there is nothing that God is judging us by. We forget all those atonement messages in the New Testament, that we are a new creation in Christ, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, that nothing can separate us from Christ. See, the combination of Tamid and Yom Kippur, the Ola and Afar, means that God has taken care of sin. It doesn't matter what it looks to the world. It doesn't matter how it looks to us personally. God has taken care of sin. And it will be finally eradicated from the earth. So two things that God does with sin. Cover them through the substitution and mediation exercise. Remove them through the Kafar Yom Kippur day exercise. When that happens, sin is gone. So on Yom Kippur, God deals with the totality of sin, not just the occasional sins that we do, the now and then failure, but no sin in its totality. 
how it affects our psyche, how it affects our spirits, how it affects our bodies, how it affects our communities, how it affects the world, how it affects the environment, all of that is dealt with. So Yom Kippur is a magnificent symbol of God's final, final resolution. You know, the question that Christians struggle with the most is, why does God allow sin to exist? Why didn't he just resolve it with a snap of his fingers in Genesis? Why isn't he doing about anything right now? Look at the nonsense happening in the world at the moment. God is doing. He has given each one of us a charger so we can stay connected with him. And as long as that charger is connected, our mobile phones have power in them. But he has also promised that one day we will not need the charger or the mobile phone. You know, the New Testament says that we live by faith and not by sight. And I think the most important part of faith is the Yom Kippur faith. To know, to believe, and to realize that one day I'll be out of this mess. One day this mess will be taken out of the picture. Nothing is more liberating than that hope, that thought. All right, so the sanctuary calendar. Two services, two focal points of the entire calendar. One is the Tamid. This happens every single day, like clockwork. It never fails. There is no stop. There is no holiday. Every morning and every evening, the Ola must be offered on behalf of the nations, the, the nation. The lamps must be lit. The incense must be burned. And then Yom Kippur. One day a year, God actually comes around. He says, all right, your sins are gone. Complete removal, renewal, reconsecration, cleansing, and whatever term you want. And this is what the sanctuary is teaching us from its rituals. That we have to stay connected with God every single day. You see, there's no such thing as a seventh day believer. We must be seven days believers. But we can also look forward to that special time when God will and say sin is gone. We can look everywhere around us. We will see nothing but the pristine holiness that God created this world to begin with. All of that embedded into a simple structure, a simple organization. If God is with us, who will be against us? You see, it does not matter what kind of Israelite you are as long as you're an Israelite. That's the lesson of the sanctuary. Every Israelite is permitted with offerings in their hands to come into the presence of God and covered by the Tamid and by Yom Kippur. No exceptions. And so at the end of the day, like Phil Wickham says in his song, which was sung, it's the first song this morning, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who's done all of this for me. That is the Christian gospel in its simplest and purest essence. That's why the sanctuary is the live-in classroom. 